Okay. All right. So in watching that video, is there anything that we want to add to our answer as far as what this, what's the difference between challenge-based learning and project-based learning? Is there anything that you observed in that video that... Okay. Yeah, then there's a, a lot of open endedness maybe. That was good. That's good. Any other thoughts? Okay, well that leads us kind of to our next question and concern that probably a lot of you are watching this. Is that yeah, that seems well and good. The kids are excited. You know, they want to reduce the number of cars in a parking lot, but here's the question of the hour. This is really our challenge for the whole seven weeks, if you want to look at the challenge that we all face, is what are the potential obstacles to using challenge-based learning when we have a standards-based curriculum? You know, what standard talks about how many cars need to be in the school parking lot? I mean, I'm sure that you can develop, you know, standards around that, but this is probably the challenge that all of you face when you think about how do you do something that's truly student-directed? Because you have standards you have to teach, you have a pacing guide you have to adhere to. So just at your table, if you could discuss for just three minutes, what are some obstacles? And then we, we want to share those out with the group. Yeah, Barbie, you might want to. Yeah, join these ladies, that'd be great. Yeah, um, well, let me just tell you a few things here. I, I, I sat at each table just a, oh, a set, a hard copy, but you have this in your notebook. If you go in your notebooks in the tabs past the templates, you should have these tools. Um, and they, and I'll talk about each one, and we'll pull them up on the on the screen, and you can also look at them online if you want to do that, because they are in, in the binder items on the Seams uh, wiki, on the big wiki. They're in the binder items. But um, really, what I want to talk about is student engagement, because you are really in the thick now, of putting on paper your units, getting down on paper. What is it I'm going to do? What's the order in which I'm going to do them? and so forth. And really, you bring CBL to life by doing, by having a high level of student engagement. And it's got to be from the second you start that unit. You really have to work hard to inspire them to be excited about what it is they're going to do. And then you have to make them feel like stakeholders, that they are invested in this project. And um, that does take time, Every t because we're kind of manipulating kids to do that. Let's just face it. That's what we're doing. And, and I always quote this. When I was in graduate school here in secondary ed, I had a teacher named Roger Collins. And he's, he told us one of the first days of classes, teaching is coercion. And I was like so offended by that. I'm like, what do you mean teaching is co coercion? That's, that's not right. Well, yeah, it is. After 35 years. Darn right, teaching is coercion. You, you are going to make kids do what they need to do, make maybe it's too strong a word, get them, entice them, um, motivate them to do what they need to do. Because you are the guardian of the curriculum. That's what the school board hired you to do, was to implement that curriculum. But, you, but when we use challenge-based learning, we want to get kids to, be, to really invest in this whole challenge. And so we've got to be exciting. We've got to leave the gate excited about it, get them excited, and how do we do that? Because when we read your units, sometimes that does not come across. We don't really know how you're going to do that. We read your hooks, but we don't really know how you're going to do that. And you need to put some thought into it. So this very first one I want to look at is the big idea to essential question, advanced planning. It's the second. And it's really two sheets that look like this. And I hope that you will take some time and actually look at this. Because the idea here is to give you some ideas, some suggestions, and some models for how are you going to get kids 
to go from your big idea to come up with some essential questions. And you want it to be exciting. You want them to be motivated to do that. So um, one of them is you can have them brainstorm. You know, when you start with kids where they, on what they know, what do they know? It helps them to feel empowered. Kids always know more than they think they, I always worked with kids who to me had like poor self-esteem. And if I started with brainstorming, then I could help them see that they actually know more than they think they know. Maybe they don't know how to organize that, but I could help them do that much. I can help them. So brainstorming is one way to do that. And I'm not gonna read this to you, but there's some brainstorming ideas. There's also research. Sometimes you give them just enough and then say, let's go out and see what we can find about this. But, but you don't want them to do heavy duty research. Maybe it's like a challenge. I'm gonna give you eight minutes and see what you can find out about blah, blah, blah. So you make it a kind of challenge. So they're not gonna be able to do any heavy research, but they're gonna do some surface stuff and see what they can come back and tell you. Um, you want them to generate questions. You've got some questions in mind that, that will work for, you, for the challenge you have in mind. So you're going to want to direct that. And that's probably one of the places where most people feel the most discomfort. How am I going to get them to the essential question that I want? And there are some ways to do that. It's really not rocket science. There really are some good ways to do that. Um, one of the, th and w once they have some questions on the board, some people say, okay, we generated this great list of essential questions. Tomorrow we're gonna talk about which one makes the cut. And then maybe you have time to sit back and look at these questions and decide what you're gonna do about it. That is one way to do it. If you're okay thinking on your feet, you can say, okay, let's group all the ones together that are really the same. Or doesn't this one say the same thing as this one? Um, you can kind of group like questions. Now you're always going to have that goofball kid who gives you that essential question that is way out in left field. And maybe someday you can use that essential question and empower him in some way or her. But, but there's always that you know, outlier, that anomaly question that you're not quite sure what to do with. You also want to ask kids, you know, there's a sheet in here also, um, and you don't have to. You don't, the, there's a document on um, making the cut. Like, what, how, do you, how do you know whether it's a good essential question? And there's a whole list of criteria for what makes a good essential question. And you might just show that to the kids. Well, a good essential question shouldn't have like prejudi prejudicial statements in there. Like, you know, who, uh, why was Lincoln the best president during wartime? Okay, that's kind of got some prejudicial information in there. So, so you want the uh, essential question to fit some criteria. It should be open-ended, shouldn't be a yes or no answer, should provide multiple solutions. There are certain things, and then you can use that lens to help the kids examine with you those essential questions and eliminate the ones that aren't gonna work. So you want to get them to a point where you are moving them, you're directing them toward the question that you want. And it, that is really time consuming. I'm glad you brought that up because it is more time consuming to get to the point of doing the challenge. I think designing a challenge is probably less time consuming than you are spending on it because it should be fairly open-ended enough that it has a life of its own. And you're gonna be the guardian of how you're going to, to direct it, but it's, it's not so much your input that makes the challenge work. It's how the kids engage themselves in the. So I wanna point out, and maybe we can go to um, another one. There, this is a, um, from big idea to essential questions. Here's a little worksheet that shows you three different scenarios. You can do think, pair, share. You can do research. You can do brainstorming. These are just three ideas. There are thousands of ways to do this, but these are just three ideas. But you want to not skip this step in the writing of your unit. You want to make sure it's articulated clearly that you have thought about how you're gonna get the kids to the essential question. Otherwise, you are missing the way in which you actually get student engagement. Because once you get buy-in, 
it's, it's smooth sailing for the teacher's point of view because they feel like they have ownership and that is a really compelling thing for kids. And I have had teachers um, write units and tell me I don't believe this is going to work, I'm going to take your word for it, but I'm not really too, uh, you know, I really am not a believer about this and uh, okay, if you say so. And then they do it and they're totally bowled over by what ki how kids react. Completely bowled over. So you want to use some energy to make this part work for you. Get them to come up with that essential question. Lead them to the challenge. Um, the challenge is something you, of course, have to have in mind because you're you know, getting the materials ready and you have to prepare the lessons and you have to know how you're going to assess them. And so you have to have that in mind. But if you can direct them in such a way, it shouldn't be too hard for them to make that leap. And sometimes, again, kids come up in groups with certain challenges, and then you are saying, tomorrow I'll tell you what the challenge is. I'm going to look over these and decide which one is feasible for us. And kids feel empowered by that. They decided something, even though they didn't really, that you are going to implement in your classroom. So the time you invest in that up front pays off. And then the second thing I want to say is that the second time you teach a challenge-based learning unit, they kind of catch on. They kind of know how this is going to work. And it is not quite as time consuming. And then the third time you do it, it's not quite as time consuming. And then next year, when you reteach this unit, it's even more streamlined because you have a better idea as to how to make this work. You are in, you're pioneers and you're in new territory and it's a little scary. And there is a, a fair amount of confusion time. You know, there's going to be confusion time where you have to stop and regroup and think and redirect. That's all part of the whole thing. But I do want to make you aware of these tools and there are a bunch of them. Take some time to actually look at them because they will help you in that unit implementation. So I think that's it. Go back to our next. Yeah, question. Um, over the past couple of days, I've looked at some units, and when, when, when folks are stating the big idea, they're giving a lot of background information, but they're really not succinctly stating what the big idea is. And I think it's important. I don't know if you want to address that. I think it's important that you have a, call it a catchphrase, right. or something that right. really is kind of like the logo for your unit. I mean, exactly. That's a nice way to put it. Um, when I have modeled this, I've, I just stick up the big idea on the board. The big idea is there. And you might want to tell your students, gee, this came from the standard, but the big idea is blah, blah, blah. You don't want it to be too big a chunk. And you know what the background information is because you needed to think about that and actually record that on your template. But a catchphrase is good because the kids know we're going to talk about clean water, we're going to talk about traffic management, we're going to talk about, you know, infectious diseases. Whatever it is, you're going to put it out there and then they can start thinking about what are some questions they have about it's that. It's good to have that background information because then any other teacher that wants to use your unit kind of understands what your big idea means. But in a lot of cases I've seen where there's no catchphrase, it's just here's all the background. So um, one of the reasons that we wanted to do this actual session with people is because we feel like everybody is kind of on a continuum here. Um, there's teacher prescribed projects and then there's challenge learning. And when we look at different units, we see that people are not right here. Some people are in different places along this continuum. And we, we're hoping that as you create more and more units, you're going to get closer and closer and closer to being true challenge-based learning. Isn't that cute? <laughs> so what we want to do today is give you some examples of this. We're going to look at a video in a minute. Um, but before we do that, we want to have a little bit of a group discussion. And we're going to talk about a unit in terms of, okay, here's what a teacher did. 
You're going to take a science unit on light or energy transformation or a geometry unit on angles. And the teacher prescribed project-based learning project was this. Construct a solar cooker. And here's a little kit. And let's make solar cookers. And then we're going to go outside and cook something with them. OK? Cool. Fun, right? How would you move the teacher from stating, this is our project, to having the students identify or suggest an appropriate challenge? Still be the solar cooker. But given the standards you address, so we, we kind of pick something that could be both math or science. Knowing the standards you address, how could you make this more challenge-based learning? And you have a question, Tom? All right, take a few minutes in your group and talk about it. How could you do it? I want to tell them about those two handouts, too, before we show the video. Oh, sorry. Did I jump ahead too fast? No, you did not. I, I just forgot about po pointing them out. I don't have them in front of me. That might be my problem. All the ones that you gave out. I'm so sorry I was late today. I had to take my son to band camp. Oh, my goodness. Which I should have been here just fine. But then we, I had to run to Kroger to get him some snacks because he's there from morning to night. And I had to get him some money out. So when I went to get money out, Kroger kept denying my card and telling me to call my institution. So I'm standing in the middle of Kroger trying to figure out. And I, my son and my husband just got back from a trip. I'm like, did your dad use our joint account? Are we out of money? So I'm in Kroger looking at my account on my phone trying to figure out why I don't have any money. I have money. Kroger won't let me take the money out of my And then the lady was like, well, there's a genie over there. I had to pay $3 to get $20 out for myself. Oh, that's true. I hate that. I hate that. So I would have been here maybe like five minutes late, but because I was wrestling with my bank. <laughs> That happened to me on vacation recently. I got denied. I had, I'm like, I have $6,000 in that account. Why am I getting denied any? And it was because I was out of town. And yeah. if you don't yeah, tell I your don't bank, you're I out of town. I usually call my bank when I'm out of town. Yeah. They put a hold on my card after they, because when the hotel did the $20 uh, deposit, yeah. hold. Hold. my bank put a hold on my card because, one, I'm in New Orleans, and this is suspicious activity. Right, right. So I had to call him. Yeah, well, please let me have my money. They ask me funny questions. Yeah, they ask me a whole bunch of questions, and it still took forever for me to release. My husband just got a job, so we actually have two incomes in our house. It's super exciting because when I called my bank, the lady on the line was, or it was a gentleman. He was like, I don't know why they're not giving you money. Your account is in good standing. And then he heard something I had never heard before, or I heard something. He said, actually, your count is in very good standing. <laughs> this is a time. first time. I didn't even go back to the plaque for my wall. I know. We already have a. I was like, less dramatic. I just had to drop off some paperwork for my son. The zombie apocalypse. Well, ho yeah. hopefully this will be helpful where you picked up. Yeah. yeah. I'll let you take this over and they can just in initial or something for the second session. Okay, I sent you some things. I sent, sent you some things late last night. Okay. All right, how are we doing? Everybody ready to report out a little? Okay. Let's start with 
these folks right here, um, Aaron and Carlson, can you guys, what do you think? this group. So drop back into the school, the interest on a local school level. All right. Did you guys have something you want to share? So there's some student choice, but like they had <laughs> certain constraints. You got these materials, have at it. Of a budget, maybe. Right. We also talked about maybe tying it into um, how we're depleting our natural resources as far as oil and gas, and then you know what are some alternative energy sources and tying that in. Good, good. So we have like social media and and you know popular culture. We've got. Uh, student, you know, concession stand concerns, and we have like thinking about oil sort shortages and energy kind of constraints that we have in in our society today. Any others want to add? What did you guys come up with? Just kind of bars and then ours. <laughs> <laughs> It would, absolutely, but sometimes we do those things. Oh, okay, sorry. on that. How about you guys? Did you come up with something? So sustainability is a, is kind of the theme there. Cool. 
I didn't want to forget you. You're good. We were, we were, everyone said everything. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, you came up with some really good ideas, and if you are interested in solar cookers, by the way, there's like a whole world of solar cookers out there. Like there are certain designs. There's an international solar cooker organization. It's very popular in areas where there are no natural resources to use to make fire. Um, there are solar cooker cookbooks. So that would be a cool thing to get the language arts teachers involved in. So um, <laughs> you, you have the right idea, though. Um, so the teacher, and you can buy kits. You can, there are all these different designs of solar cookers. And you can buy kits. So you can give them the whole project-based learning thing. And the kids would learn a lot. But you could see the variety of ways in which you can make that challenge-based learning. And the solutions are more open-ended. Good job with that. OK. Oh, one thing before we, we switch over, I did give you a couple other handouts for you to keep. One is um, you can't have enough of these, because these are kind of nice for when you are planning out your units. And I do believe they are in your binders. But if not, you have one here. Um, There is on the wiki, under the binder things, not under RET, but yeah, under the binder things. Uh, we can get you some of these. And then the other thing I gave you was, this is just another uh, Bloom's taxonomy thing. I can't get enough of these, because I really think that these are very helpful when you actually plan lessons. And obviously, challenge-based learning is up on that evaluation end of Bloom's taxonomy synthesis. It probably inc incorporates analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. So I just like to share these with people. I think that um, actually Catherine Blankenship found this for us at some point. And I just think it is a really great resource. As you go to plan, you need to be thinking about this stuff. This is what where we want kids um, to be is in that evaluation end. We obviously can't do that totally. but and And I'm hoping, too, that you could see the math and science in this particular solar cooker activity, this challenge, because there's plenty of math and understanding the angles, and there's plenty of science in talking about energy transformations and um, all, all sorts of things. Even, even light, even if you're teaching light, the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection. Um, so all of that stuff is there. You just have to make sure that that's part of what the kids are learning, not just cooking the hot dog with the solar cooker, but actually how that happens. OK, enough said. If you have a guest, um, never realize somebody do the solar cooker. Yeah, I think it'd be cool. I am. All right. So this kind of leads us to how we're going to finish out, which is that we want to talk a little bit about the um, importance of a really good hook. That that is something that I think is real is crucial and probably understated somewhat, um, especially if you want it to be open ended. And you want students to have some ownership and feel like they help develop the challenge. But if you, the way to do that is to find a hook that very closely matches the direction you were thinking already, but is also very engaging to students. So that and that that sometimes could be a challenge. Um, so, you know, we wanted to talk about that. I wanted to highlight we, uh, David McMurray was very um, g gracious and let us uh, videotape his, uh, the third unit he implemented. I think it was the second unit he implemented. Um, and it's his really making music unit. Um, I don't know if you want to give a quick overview of what the, the standards are for that unit before I showed the video. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can send them this video. Yeah, absolutely. And then you'll have more. You can see the whole thing if you like, because it, it actually shows the kids making the project at the end, too. We were kind of getting to that part. Uh, but in the interest of time, I wanted to at least give you a kind of a feel of how it was done in a real classroom. I mean, we can try to simulate it with you all acting as students, but those were actual teenagers he was working with and not us. So um, that may, I think that makes a big difference. Um, so, kind of to finish out, I don't know if people have some closing thoughts. Um, 
Was it helpful to watch a couple of these videos? So that's one question we have for you. Was there anything that maybe turned a light bulb on in your head about what challenge-based learning was and what it's not? And what, what will you kind of take away of this? I don't know. I mean, these are, these are kind of rhetorical questions, but I don't know if anybody wanted to share out loud what they, uh, what they thought about it. All right, exactly. Yeah, and then think about, obviously, he had, a very, he had a unique situation, and he found a hook that really matched the culture of his school as well, which was, I think was a really neat, neat thing to do. So we would, go ahead. I'm sorry, are you thinking any differently about CBL than you did when you walked in the door today? All right, yeah. And the one you found was perfect. Oh, okay. I mean, it, it couldn't have been more perfect, really, for what, what you were trying to accomplish. That was the beauty of it, I think. Okay, all right. Are there any other takeaways anybody can articulate or share? I think just reiterate the importance of the hook. I mean, for me, it would have been, if we could have like seen this earlier and then the video making later, because I know for me, like I can already adjust some of my hooks because I just have a video I tie and that's it, my hook. Right. So now I can fix it, but our third unit's due in like four days, <laughs> the video next week. Okay, that's good. That's good feedback. I think next year what we'll do is the first day will be like a 24-hour marathon <laughs> of all the workshops that you needed to hear the first day. But anyway, okay, we'll do. We'll work on that for next year. All right, well, um, I am going to talk to the SEAMS teachers for just a couple minutes about some just end, end of the times logistics. So, RET teachers, you can stay and listen to me gab if you like.